Welcome to part two of our conversation with Adriana Gibson. Tell me more about um, getting into investigating. Tell me more about uh, when you started saying, I'm going to, I want to dig into this deeper. Was there a goal in mind when when you started doing this other than, you know, I want to learn more? Uh, Was there something of, I, I want to help people understand this. I want to help people heal. What was, what was your, your mindset going into it? I think I was curious to see if, uh, if any of this was real. Cause it's like, there's like a hundred different ghost hunting shows out there. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see if this was legitimate. Like if anything like this just happened and I was very curious and as time went on I saw that how much of a community there is. And like, there's a lot of people that feel like validated. It's like, okay, the paranormal does exist. Like, so maybe it is, say, like my brother communicating to me from the other side. So I can see that it's very healing for other people to have like their experiences validated. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just saw like where the community feel, how very helpful it can be in the paranormal field. And I just started to love it more and more. And I've met some of the most amazing people in the paranormal field. And it's like it just opened up this whole new world for me. And I just fell in love with it. So tell me about some of the first things and experiences that you had once entering that, that really, you know, continued to drive that interest or maybe really surprised you or uh, made you go, wow, this is, uh, (laughs) this is a journey I want to stick with. Hmm. I would say the closest thing to that was, uh, I got invited to this location called the Timbrook Mansion, which is like uh, just outside of Albany, New York. Uh, a paranormal investigator I've become a good friends with invited me to come out there and I asked my grandmother to come with me because like she used to watch all these ghost hunting shows all the time like she's sensitive to the paranormal too but she's never done like a ghost hunt like I wanted her to come with me because I wanted her to see why I loved it so much and uh, she did and during uh, a seance she got the message that uh, that her grandmother you know is watching over her she learned that she had a spirit guide named uh, Eleanor watching over her. And she also got the message that one of her former friends uh, told her that uh, basically, uh, I can't remember correctly, his children who work at the same place as she does. He just basically said, like, her name's Louise. He's like, Louise, you've got to calm down with the end, like the animosity in the workplace. Like, it's not worth it. Let me go is what the... Uh, it's the kind of like feeling they would get. So it, it's like this spirit was telling my grandmother, like through the seance, to like, you gotta find that they like, my family needs to calm down with the animosity in the workplace. Like, so she was very like surprised by that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's when she realized that it's a social outlet for me. She could see why I love it. And like, there's a lot of good that can come from the paranormal if used correctly. Mm-hmm. And, uh, she just realized, wow, she, like, she loves it. And ever since then, she'll ask me, like, have you done any ghost hunts lately? Or, like, if people ask, she'd be like, like, yeah, I had this happen. I had that happen. So it was nice that, that we could bond over that. Sure. What happened at the Tim Brook Mansion? Uh, what do you mean by that? Meaning, like, what's the history? What's the story that makes it a haunted location? Uh, let me see. Um I believe there was a family, uh, the Tembrook family that used to live there. It used to be their home. I think they used to do like business transactions there. Mm-hmm. Like it was no family that used to live in the house. And it, it eventually became the headquarters for the, the Tri-City uh, New York Paranormal Society, who mm-hmm. I've been friends with for many years now. And they would just occasionally pick up uh, different spirits. like, And uh, it just, it's a very active location. Is there a recipe that would increase the likelihood of paranormal activity in a location? I mean, meaning history, setting, things in the building, things that people could even do now to increase the likelihood of of experiences happening. I know it's a fairly broad-based question, but just (laughs) curious what your thoughts are. Um, I think it depends. There's... There's not always, like, a gruesome death. Like, some, like, TV shows make it look. Sometimes it's just... The people that used to live there just love it so much. They just choose not to leave. They love it there Mm -hmm. and they don't mind communicating with people there. Like sometimes the right materials can conduct enough energy. Sometimes it's just like something on the property. Mm -hmm. Like I once used to work 
at this uh, uh, medical building, and I was told that it used to be a tuberculosis hospital, I think back in like the 1920s or something like that. And uh, they tore it down and then buried the debris and then built this new building on top of it. And I was told that once in the middle of the night, an employee heard a little girl laughing and that freaked them out. Sure. Because there was no reason for that. I was like, oh, okay. So I think it depends on any number of things. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously certainly uh, different things that can uh, trigger in different ways, whether it be a historic location like that where there was a lot of suffering. Uh, What's a a location that you've been to where you were genuinely kind of surprised by the activity? Um, I would say one that that definitely surprised me the most so far Mm -hmm. probably would be the Dr. Best house that's in uh, Middleburg, New York. Like it's off the map. Like nobody would really like know about this place unless you like, like basically advertised it. What's the story of the Dr. Best house before we hear about what happened to you there? So from what I understand, family used to live there thick in the early or late uh, 1800s, something like that. And, uh, not only was it a family house, it was also a doctor's office. So there's like a separate area where they would like do surgeries, you know, it's like general checkups and that kind of thing. And uh, it, as soon as you walk into the house, it just looked like people just got up and left. Wow. So it's possible that some people might have died there. There are people that just might, like I said, with other places, they might just love it there. So this is not like a, his, is this a, a historic location that's been set back yeah. up to look like they just left? Or did they literally just leave and you just kind of, nobody's really picked up? <laughs> no, it's a, uh, it's basically a medical museum that okay. they tried to keep as like, like a mixture of a house setting and a medical exhibit. So, mm-hmm. so they wanted to maintain what it might have looked like as much as they could. Okay. And they really did a good job. So what happened when you were there? So I've been there at least twice. Uh, that was one of the locations where we had the seance that said to take a Reiki class. Um, Certainly when I walked in there, because I'm sensitive, like right between the eyes where the third eye is, Mm -hmm. I would get like pressure right there if I could feel like high energy. Like, oh yeah, there's definitely energy in there. Especially whenever I go into Duncan's room that's upstairs, my head hurts like crazy in that room. And uh, there was one time we were walking through there and all of a sudden when I was like, uh, I think I like looking towards the parlor or one of the other rooms, like right between the eyes. It's like something hit me there. Like, whoa! I don't know what that was. And uh, I just had all kinds of paranormal experiences there. And uh, one of the things that to tie this in with another location, mm-hmm. I was shown that there was. Uh, I want to say it was. Um, it was some kind of medical device. I want to say it was uh, like an electric shock device. I don't know. It was, it was something like big inside glass. And um, the investigator points out to me, but like, look at the names on, uh, on the glass. And it says, uh, I think uh, Vanderbilt and Tenbrook. And I look at them like, as in Tenbrook Mansion. And he looks at me like, yup. I'm like, are you choking with me right now? So like both of these locations are connected to each other. How interesting. That is crazy. Yeah. It, it just kind of gives you more confirmation that, you know, you're on the right path of what you're looking at. And there's something something else on the other side that's that's communicating. Exactly. When, when a location, a uh, historic location uh, like the Dr. Best House is set up in a way, you know, obviously it's a museum type setting now. But I, I understand these locations, how you set them up and they, they are trying to be authentic as they can to the period in which they were being used do you think that increases the likelihood of a haunting or does that decrease it uh, in the sun the assumption that maybe uh, you know it's under different ownership and somebody turned it into a uh, a modern bed and breakfast or something of that nature uh you know and and it does nothing of the feel of of what it once was i certainly think that if you try to like like whether it's objects you try to have the same feel it can potentially uh, trigger more energy because there might still be some residual energy attached to the items you know, that you're using. It could be something that they're familiar with. So you try to keep as much of the original stuff in as you can. It can help with the, with the triggering activity. But places I've noticed where it's not quite so like left as it was, 
you can still get some activity, but I definitely notice that it's increased a bit more if it's left as it is as best they can. That wraps up part two of our conversation with Adriana Gibson. A big thank you to her for joining us and sharing her experiences on the program. And thank you to you for supporting us and keeping us on the air. We wouldn't exist without it. Until next time, for the Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.